numbers get you off, because this is one of the most important topics in all of software. A lot of people deal with prices, they spend money, they sometimes even charge people money, but there's really no understanding of where these prices come from. So today I'd like to do an overview of the field and really get an idea in your heads about where prices come from and how to set them. Before we go into detail, I'd just like to give you a quick overview of me. I'm from Florida, so I'm getting used to the cold up here, the cold 90 degree weather. I'm the, I'm the owner of Taprun, which is a consulting company in, in Florida. Previous to that, I was a project manager in the software field. I wrote bids. I oversaw contractors. I really got a feel for how value is defined and what people are looking for when they start opening up their wallet. Prior to that, I spent about 10 years as a software engineer in the field of oceanography, and I have a master's in business and a master's in software engineering. In addition, I actually wrote an entire book on pricing, but we're not going to go into that today. So I was told the first thing I should do as a speaker is to get an idea of who I'm speaking to. So I have just two very basic questions for you all, and just hopefully a show of hands. How many of you like money? Anyone? Oh, this is great. We have a real audience. Okay, one more question. Maybe my luck will hold up. Would any of you like more money? <laughs> that is great. Okay. Well, the good news is everything you learned in school is absolutely wrong. You don't make more money by working harder. You don't make more money by adding functionality. You don't even make more money by caring. How do you make more money? You want to guess the word? Pricing. Exactly. And I think pricing is very complicated, it's deceptively complicated. So let's start off with a little exercise. I have here a bottle of water, half a liter. How much do you think half a liter of water should cost? What's the ideal price? A nickel. A nickel? Okay. Anyone else? Free. 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 Anyone else? A dollar. A dollar. Okay, so I have a bunch of different prices. And the actual answer is it really depends. It depends a lot. And here are a couple of examples of places where you can buy water. You can go to a store, and you can spend a dollar on water. You can buy a bottle. Or, if you lived in my old apartment, you would spend 20 bucks a month and get as much water as you wanted for unlimited, 20 bucks. And if you went to an Office Depot or an Office Max or a CompuSA, if those are still around, you can drink all the water you wanted for free. Now, in every case, this is the exact same product. It's clean, drinkable, potable water. So why are different companies charging different amounts for the exact same thing? Expectation, convenience, sure. Amount. All good ideas, yeah. All those plus, what I'm shooting for, were goals. Every company is going to have a different goal when selling their product. And we usually think in terms of profit maximization. How do I make the most money from this water? How do I make the most money from my software? But the truth is, making the most money isn't always your strategic goal, as scary as it may be. And here are a couple of others that you might want to think about when you're dealing in the software field. First, of course, is penetration pricing. Let's say that you have a brand new product or you're a brand new consultant. You're entering the field and you're trying to sell your wares. Well, guess what? You're a risky proposition for someone. You have maybe no proven track record. Your name isn't known. You might be a bad investment for a company. So what do you do? A lot of companies will lower their prices in order to enter the market. Instead of charging a dollar on the dollar, they'll charge 80 cents on the dollar in the hopes that companies will say, you know what? He's cheaper, so maybe I can take a risk on it. Of course, the reverse is also true. You can have satiation pricing. Let's say that you're a, you own the market. You're one of these big players like Microsoft or McDonald's, and you own your market. Well, what do you do? You keep your prices lower than they could be to prevent people from entering, for pre preventing people from penetrating the market with their lower prices. If you want to compete with McDonald's, they have the dollar menu. You would have to come in at 50 cents, 40 cents on the dollar, and you would never be able to do that. I was dealing with a company recently which had liquidity issues. They had a product, it was good, and they could sell it, but they needed money right now. Their runway was like three months. 
months. So they had to maximize for terms of, of receiving funds. They had to get the money in now, pay up front for a year, and we'll give you a huge discount. They were only getting seven cents on the dollar, but it kept them alive so they could seek out profits later. And of course, I'm sure we're all familiar with goodwill. When you have a product, and maybe your reputation is bad, or something terrible happened in the world, you can increase your, your perception, you can increase your reputation by charging less than you otherwise could be, by not trying to maximize profits. But how do we go about this? Let's say, okay, we want to maximize our profits. What do we do? I've seen a lot of people pitch their startups, and it's always the same. I have this great, cool, fascinating idea. Come fund me. But what you really want to do is think about the problem that you're solving when you're selling software. So I have a couple of examples up here, and hopefully these are fairly simple. Why do people play World of Warcraft? Because it solves the problem of being bored. Why do people use Google Maps? Because it solves the problem of getting lost. Why do people use TurboTax? Because they hate going to jail for not paying their taxes. Now, a lot of companies will stop there. They'll say, okay, we've identified a problem, we have a solution, come buy our products. But that won't work. You want to guess why? You haven't dollarized it. When you dollarize a problem, you say exactly how painful this problem is, you're able to charge a whole lot more money. If I see someone who's bored and they're spending $400 a month on QVC purchases, and I can say, hey, this World of Warcraft game will save you 400 bucks, how about I charge you $250? Now, $250 may sound outrageous for a video game, but if you're saving someone money, that's like giving them a free $150. Google Maps, if you tell someone, oh, you're getting lost all the time, and you're spending $100 in gas, well, guess what? We have this fantastic solution for $70. You can save $30 by using our product. If someone pays accountants $500 every year, and you can offer TurboTax for $400, Again, that's free money. When you can dollarize something, when you can demonstrate that what you're offering is a solution that's a discount to what they're spending now, you can make a lot more money. Basically, what you want to do when you offer a product is to say, I'm not giving you software. I'm giving you this magic box. And if you put $1 in, you can take $10 out every single time. And that is one of the easiest pitches in all of marketing. You're selling money at a discount. Okay? So if you do that, obviously you'll profit. But what happens when people demand a discount? I'm sure a lot of people who are contractors especially, they hear customers say, I demand a discount. So well, what can you do? There are basically three alternatives. You can fold and say, yes, I will give you that discount. And chances are, it'll help you make the sale. Or you can say, no, no discounts for you. I'm standing firm on my prices. Or you can negotiate. And there are reasons why you would go with each tactic. If you fold, there's an obviously negative part. Some people always ask for a discount. Some people will ask everyone for a discount, just on the off chance that they'll get one. But there are other people, I think the technical term is cheapskates, who will only buy when you're cheap. And if you keep discounting, you are going to attract those people like flies on you-know-what. And more importantly, they're not going to take you seriously. You are no longer the $10,000 consultant. You are no longer the $1,000 consultant. You're like the $10 intern. You're the guy that they don't really even have to listen to. A lot of other people will, will say no, no discounts. And that's good in some ways. People who ask habitually for discounts but don't need them, they'll stay your customers. But you'll lose out on a lot of sales. That may be good if you have money in the bank or you have cash flow and you can pursue and use your marketing dollars for better customers. But it's a risk. In general, if you are a consultant where you're dealing with very high-priced software, high being dependent upon you, I would recommend negotiating. And the typical advice that I give is always negotiate price in tandem with something else. Generally, scope is the first thing that I would suggest. If you don't want to, if a customer doesn't want to spend twenty thousand dollars for your solution, it only 
don't want to spend 15, then you can prioritize features. Oh, okay. I see that money is more important to you than benefits. Well, why don't you chop out features A, B, and C, and I can match your $15,000 price tag. And that essentially gives your customer two choices. They can say, yes, that sounds great. I'll take the lower scope. Or maybe they'll think, you know what? I really need those features. Maybe $20,000 isn't too much. But the important thing is you get the conversation started. Anyone have any other ideas about what you can negotiate with besides scope? Yeah. Future work. Future work. That's a little risky unless you get it in writing, but definitely. Time. Time. You can push out the schedule a little bit and say, instead of delivering in one month, we'll deliver in ten. Anything else? One of the things that I like to suggest is guarantees. Oh, sure, we'll build software, but we're not going to guarantee that you'll have 24-7 up, uptime. Or we're not going to guarantee that it'll be HIPAA compliant. Or we're not going to guarantee that we'll get back to you within 30 minutes if you have a problem. The important thing is to look at the value that you're offering and the price. And if you're going to lower the price, you want to lower the value that the customer receives in tandem. But negotiation doesn't necessarily mean making less money. You can actually make more money through negotiation. And a lot of people don't realize that. I have a very simple value map here. And it looks at an offering that you can try to upsell, you can try to sell in addition as part of your negotiation. And the yellow squares represent items that cost you the same amount as the value they receive. They cost you $10,000 to develop, and they value it $10,000. You can't negotiate with that, because you're still going to be behind in terms of the price they're willing to pay. And you certainly don't want to negotiate and try to sell something in the red. I mean, it costs you a lot of money, but they don't care about it. What you want to do when you're negotiating, when you're trying to upsell someone, is find things that cost you almost nothing, but they value quite a bit. When I was a project lead back in Rhode Island, we spent one man day, one man day, on a little task to make a graph. And it doesn't sound like it's that complicated, but it saved something like $100,000 a year in labor for the company. Were they willing to pay more to save $100,000 more than it cost me for one mandate? You better believe it. The important thing is when you think about your pricing, you want to be as flexible as possible. If you're offering a custom service every single time, if you're doing everything from scratch, you're not going to have any flexibility in your pricing. Your pricing is going to be dominated by your labor and by your other expenses. But if you have a product, if you've written a book, a piece of software, something that you sell multiple times, you can charge basically anything you want for it because all the money has already been spent. I work for a company where we were doing everything from scratch. Every single software project was a new task. And we had no flexibility. And then we decided, you know what? We'll focus on libraries. We'll standardize our procedures. We'll standardize our requirement scaling methods. And suddenly, our costs dropped astronomically, and when people came in, they thought they were getting custom service, but we were just duct taping things together, and we were able to beat other people with much lower rates. So, here's one of my pricing idols, and yes, pricing idols is a thing. Some of you may know Teddy Roosevelt, he was the President of the United States, and he actually also won the Nobel Prize uh, later as well. In 1912, he had a pricing problem. He had printed out a million brochures uh, suggesting that he should be the best president, and they were vital to his campaign. And right before he handed them out, he noticed something very strange in this very picture. There was a little copyright sign, and he realized if he handed these out, he would be sued for probably $3 million, which in 1912 was quite a bit. So on the one hand, he needed to hand out these pamphlets, on the other, he did not need to pay $3 million. So he came up with a plan, and he decided he was going to offer a negotiation. So he called up the copyright holder, and he suggested a number. Does anyone want to take a guess what he knocked that price down from $3 million to? No? Well, he called up the customer. He called up the, the copyright holder, and he said, I've got the best deal in the world for you. I will put your picture on my brochures 
How much will you pay me for? <laughs> and the guy on the other end of the line said, Oh, I don't know. I, this has never happened before. How does two hundred fifty dollars sound? <laughs> so Teddy Roosevelt saved himself three million dollars. He's got a great story out of all of that. And what's the point of this story? Well, the point is the right price is not always obvious. But also, when you're in a negotiation, you should both be receiving value from the negotiation. And sometimes, the value is not just the dollar amount. It could be something very different entirely. So, let's think about who our ideal customer is. I created this model, and I think you can think about your customers in terms of their ability to pay, and their willingness to pay. Obviously, you want to find the ideal customer, the one that has tons of money, tons of problems, just needs to throw money at it and, and get that thing solved. And that's the group that you target. But there are other people as well. A lot of times when you have a new product, something brand new, you may be able to find customers with tons of money, but they're not really willing, willing to spend money on you or on your product. You may have to educate them. Or they may have a high willingness to pay. They may say, yes, this is exactly what we need to solve our products and our problems. But they might not have a lot of money in hand, just like that company I negotiated with that had low liquidity. You can find it. This is how SaaS works a lot of the time. You pay a certain amount every single month. You don't have to pay a whole lot up front. But why don't we just focus on our target market? Everyone always says, focus on your key target audience. Why wouldn't you want to do that? I'm very proud of this next picture. You'll be leaving money on the table. Just because you can sell to your target market doesn't mean that you can't sell to other people. Maybe you'll make a million dollars in your target, a couple hundred thousand dollars a year and there and elsewhere. When you're dealing with products or product-sized programs, that is absolutely free money. And you want to make sure that you get as much as they're willing to pay and as much as your ideal customer is willing to pay. And you do that through something called tiering. Sometimes it's called Meddling. Bronze, silver, gold. Good, better, best. Different packages. Different tiers that appeal to different people. And the cheapskates, the people who don't have money, will buy the bronze package. And the people who are a little bit better off, maybe the silver. And your target customer, your ideal, he'll buy the gold. He'll buy the enterprise product that, that you can charge an arm and a leg for. Two obvious tiers. Almost every single product. At least think about this. This may not be appropriate, but think about B2B and B2C. When you're dealing with businesses, you're almost guaranteed to be able to sell for more money than when you're dealing with general consumers. Unless you're dealing with consumers like Ted Turner and Bill Gates, the businesses will have more cash, and they'll be easier to sell to because you can make a dollar argument. You've got this profit motive. We can help you get there. Consumers don't generally have that. They focus on saving money, and that's a harder sale to make. So, one of the most common tiers I see is, is a freemium tier, a free tier. So, I've been asking people, what do you call a customer on a free tier? And every single time I hear crickets. And there's a reason for that. Someone on a free plan is not a customer. They may be valuable if they can spread the word, if they're what's called a sneezer and they can tell everyone else about your product. But, in general, they're, they're not really worth all that much. Their value is the ability to be upsold to higher tiers. You want to get them in the pipeline using tripwire pricing and get them to move up to more expensive plants and pay you money. So the key in doing that is to limit, limit their offering somehow. Are they going to be geography limited? A lot of software companies use geography, surprisingly. DVDs. If you buy a DVD in China or in Africa, you can't play them here. They're region locked. StarCraft, if you want to play with your friends, you've got to buy it here because you can only network with people in the region. Maybe content limited. I think paywalls. New York Times, Washington Post is a great example of this. If you read one or two articles and you like it, well, guess what? Time to open up your wallet. You uh, have to pay more to read more. It can be functionality limited. I was using some scientific projects and software recently, and to do some simple tests and to follow a tutorial, it was free. But when I had real business uses and when I had really complicated formulas, I had to pay just like everyone else. 
be time limited. This is one of the most common themes from shareware pricing, and of course, it's also used in SaaS. Try us for a month for free, see how you like it. And then after that, upsell, kick them off the free tier. Or it can be user limited. You see this often in time tracking software, like Freckle. You sign up when you're one person, and as your agency grows, and as you get more people, and as you derive more value from the product, you have to start paying on a per seat basis. So hopefully now you think, okay, pricing makes sense, I can do this. Unfortunately, pricing gets really complicated in the real world. It doesn't follow models. And I'll give you some examples. Obviously, I'm sure you've all heard of psychological pricing at this point. There's a reason why infomercials say $19.99 or $19.95 instead of $20. It just sounds different. There's a reason why they say that's a $299,000 house, not a $300,000 house. Even though you know in your head it's a trick, you, you, you still kind of fall for it. But this is basic. This is stuff that everybody knows. What are some things that are more advanced? There's something called anchoring. And being on the coast, I'm sure you all know what anchors are. You take something heavy, you tie it to a rope, you tie it to a boat, you throw it overboard, and the boat won't move. Well, the good news is, or the bad news, is that pricing can be anchored as well. You can psychologically anchor someone's expectations by using pricing. So let's say I have this package. It's the gold package. So it's the gold tier. And you have no idea what it is. It could be nuclear software, nuclear reactor software. It could be a tic-tac-toe program. Maybe it doesn't even compile. You have no idea. $5,000 might be a good price. Might not be a good price. I don't know. But let's throw some anchors in here with some lower prices. Well, suddenly I have a silver plan, which is one one thousandth of the cost. I have a bronze plan, which is almost one two thousandth of the cost. Suddenly, someone who sees this is going to be saying, wait, what, what's the deal with the gold plan? Why is it so expensive? Why, why would I even bother paying more money when I can get similar plans for much less money? But anchoring doesn't have to go down. You can anchor upwards as well. Suddenly, that gold plan, that very same plan, looks pretty cheap. I mean, if you have a need, $5 million, $4 million, or I'm going to take one thousandth of that and buy the gold plan, something is going on here. They must be shortchanging you. This must be some kind of trick. So how do we abuse this knowledge? <laughs> no? Okay, how do we use this knowledge? Well, something called decoy pricing. Decoy pricing is just what you think. You set a price that you expect no one to buy. It's like a decoy duck. It's not, it's a product that you can buy, but no one's going to buy it. And The Economist has done, the magazine The Economist has done great jobs at raising revenue by using this technique. So this is a little bit less subtle probably than you'll see in the real world, but it gets the point across. Here we have a couple different prices. We have two high prices and a low price. So it's just like anchoring before. These two high prices anchor upwards. People say, okay, well, this software obviously has to cost somewhere around $10,000. I'm not going to think about the gold plan. The gold plan is stupid. The gold plan is silly. It's probably the junk plan. Obviously, I need to spend more. And then they look at the platinum and the diamond, and they say, you know, it's only $1 more. Why don't I go from the diamond to the platinum? Why don't I just get that better product? I mean, it's only $1. Why do you even take a risk? It's not even worth talking about. And immediately, this, do this decoy had pushed people up. I can guarantee you that instead of the diamond plan, they had the El Chico mud plan for one dollar. Not as many people would have bought the expensive plan. So here's a little test to see if you're paying attention. You spent hundred thousand dollars in software development fees, and you have a worldwide market of hundred customers. I made the math easy. Anyone want to guess what you should charge? Two thousand dollars. Okay. Well, the answer is, I have no idea. I don't know. You, don't, you shouldn't know either. What you spend has absolutely no relation to the value that you can provide or the, or the price that you can charge. I've worked as a software engineer on many projects, and they were death marches. We spent millions and millions and millions of dollars and wound up with a product which solved no problems, a product which wasn't really usable, and which nobody wanted. And when people look at software they can buy, 
They don't think, hmm, Microsoft Word, that sounds interesting. How many hours, no, did you have people working on that for? <laughs> or they don't say, hmm, Drupal and WordPress, which one has more development hours? They don't do that. They look to see what meets their needs. Oh, Scrivener hasn't been developed for as long, but it meets my needs as a novel writer. Oh, WordPress might be a, a project which has fewer hours than SharePoint, but you know what? It meets my needs. Don't confuse effort with value. Don't confuse the effort with price. It does work in a couple, couple tiny niche areas, but in software, I've never seen any evidence that you can tell someone that you spent a lot of effort and really worked hard on it and get them to pay more money for it. So here's the traditional view of pricing, and hopefully you're not know economists in the room because I flipped the axes to make this look a little simpler. Generally, we think that the higher the price, the further along on the x-axis, the fewer people will buy. And logically, that makes sense. If I'm selling lemonade for a dollar, probably get a lot of sales. If I'm selling it for a hundred dollars, probably only the really rich or the really thirsty people are going to buy, right? Well, the bad news is this pricing model does not work in the real world. It absolutely flounders. And there are a lot of discontinuities, places where it just breaks. I'm going to show you a few, and this is not to scale, but I should get the point across. The freemium barrier. There's a reason why a lot of companies have free prices, a free tier, and it's because as soon as you get your wallet out, you're a lot less likely to buy. People have risk aversion. They're afraid of taking risks. They're afraid of losing what they have. Uh, so as soon as you charge a cent, as soon as you charge a dollar, People are going to be thinking about the risk. They're going to be thinking, I don't know. I've seen people that drive Bentleys, people that make millions of dollars, hem and haw over a 99 cent iPhone app because they are that risk averse. If you can get them in, get them in early, you're much more likely to get them to try your product and then you can upsell them later. Okay, once they have their wallet out, certainly the rest makes sense, right? That's all logical, that's all linear. No, not so much. We have what's called the $100 Rambo Zone. It's called that because I named it that. Let's say that I go out and I say, you know what, I've got this beautiful, brand new, shiny red Lamborghini just down that dark alleyway. Would anyone like to buy it? And you'd probably all say, no, it's probably a trick. You're going to take my wallet and make me sad. But this happens in the real world. If you're a consultant, and you're offering your services at $10 as an expert in artificial intelligence, is anyone going to take you seriously? If you're selling the next best thing to solve a business's multi-billion dollar problems, you're going to offer it for $3. Does that make sense? They're going to completely reject you, just out of hand. I was talking to a roofer recently, and he said every time he goes into wealthy areas, he raises his price by $10,000. Not because he has a better product, not because he offers better workmanship, not because of any reason other than the fact that he wants to be taken seriously. It's real. This is what I call the high-low zone. This is where you shift from low-touch sales to high-touch sales. When you're selling something for 5 or 10 or $15 on your website, you can just stick it up there, slap a price on, click a buy me button, and you're done. But as you get more expensive, 1000 10000 20000 depending upon your audience, you're getting to a point where they expect salesmanship. They expect to be wined and dined. They expect to have things explained to them in very simple terms. And there's a price point at which you can't afford to send people out on airplanes. You can't afford to have salesmen. It's going to depend where, what industry you're in. But there's a point at which the high-low zone converges, and you just cannot make a sale profitably at that price. Okay, so that all makes sense. Is that it? No. One more. And this is a very interesting area called Devlin Good. Bobo was an economist uh, about 100 years ago. And he discovered that some people just like to spend money. I mean, think about things like wine, and scotch, and art, and things like that, jewels. People buy them, but they buy them because they're expensive. If you give someone a $10,000 emerald ring, wow, that's, that's so nice. But if it only costs 50 bucks, it's not that impressive. The actual price tag of the good makes it more valuable to the consumer. 
And there are many examples of companies that apply the enterprise package and not use all of its features. Just so they can say, we spent a lot of money on it, we've obviously tackled the problem, and we're going to solve it because, look, we bought the most expensive package. $15,000 Apple Watch. $15,000 Apple Watch. Well, I wasn't the buyer, unfortunately, but in many ways, yes. I mean, functionally, same thing as one of the cheaper iPhone watches. It's just, they're kind of, in my opinion, floating and demonstrating their wealth. Another great example of that from the Apple world came out when the iPhone just started. And they had a program called I Am Rich. I don't know if anyone bought it here. Oh, no. I bet you can guess what the purpose of it was. So it listed at $999. Even after Apple's cut, the author still made over $600. And it had a little poem with some misspellings, and it displayed a jewel. A picture, of a, a picture of a jewel, not a real jewel. And people bought it. Dozens of people bought it before Apple pulled it out of embarrassment. And people would not have bought something with misspellings at a dollar. They wouldn't have bought it at $2. But at a thousand bucks, look, it's a great way to show off. Why not? That's a devil and good. You've got to remember that slide I had before. Effort does not equal price. You've got to think about what you are selling and the price. So, some of you may be familiar with this guy, uh, Bill Shakespeare. And he wrote a lot of poetry. I've been told that this one, this part, is particularly good. A rose by any other name would smell as sweet. A lot of people believe this, but when it comes to pricing, Here's my opinion. Don't trust it. In fact, don't trust any poets at all. Names matter. Now I'm going to give you an example. Does anyone here work for WooFu? No? Okay, good. I'm not going to feel embarrassed. Here's a picture from WooFu's pricing page. And as someone who studied Latin in high school, this made me very happy. Gratis, ad hoc, bona fide, carpe diem. What's the problem? Okay, yeah, no one knows Latin. Let's say the people did know Latin which a lot of people don't. Doesn't make sense. What makes bona fide better than ad hoc? What makes gratis worse than carpe diem? These names don't make any sense. So people are going to look, and they're not going to be guided toward the product that best fits their needs, or more importantly, toward the price that best fits your needs. What you want to do is take an opportunity when you name things to guide people to, to the proper plan. You don't want people at an enterprise company using the cheapy plan. I would recommend something, even something simple, like instead of ad hoc, freelancer. Instead of bona fide, small business. Instead of carpe diem, enterprise. When you guide people, you're more likely to be able to sell them to the correct one. But if you want to be really devious, you can use naming to prevent people from buying certain packages. Instead of freelance, what if I called it the baby freelancer plan. Yeah? I mean, if you're a freelancer, what do you care? It's just pay with a credit card. But let's say you work for an enterprise, and you have to do some expense reports. It's going to go up a couple levels. If you work for General Dynamics, for instance, do you want to fill out a form that says, yes, I just need some money for the baby freelancer plan? <laughs> of course not. You're going to buy the exclusive enterprise super fantastic plan. Because you're a big company, and a difference of what? $55 is not even a rounding error. It's not even a rounding error of a rounding error for a large company. So you really want to use this opportunity. This is one of the biggest mistakes I see on pricing pages. Guide people to the right plan. Often it's not even about money. But this is a failure. I'm going to show you a success. And I've done a survey of, I think, 50, 50 pricing pages so far. And almost all of them have gotten this part wrong. This company got it right, it's smart sheet. What do you see there? You see, yeah, as soon as you see contact us with a phone number, you know you're going to get pitched, right? You know that wallet's going to open, you're going to have to buy another wallet and then spend the money in that one too. But for some companies, it's worth it. If, if you have only basic prices like 14 39 59 you are severely capping the amount of money that you can make. The most money you're going to make is the highest price. If you have an enterprise price, on the other hand, you have license to charge anything. And people will bring their own opinions with them as they call. If you have Microsoft calling in, 
You better believe they're going to be willing to spend a lot of money. They might buy. But if you have Tapron LLC, well, maybe a little bit more, but probably not to the same level. But this is great because it's self-selecting, and unless you tailor what you have to other people, let's say someone wants a self-hosted service. Maybe it never even occurred to you, but if they're offering a million bucks a year, well, maybe I'll think about it. If someone wants HIPAA compliance, hey, didn't even think of that, but yeah. As long as you can charge enough to cover your needs and make some profit, why not? Why not have an enterprise plan? This is the easiest thing you can do to open yourself up to customers who are willing to spend more money. So I'm just going to have two more questions for you, and then I'll open up for questions to me. Let's say that you hire a pricing analyst, and that means some other guy, someone maybe less trustworthy. And <laughs> I'm not sure how to take that. And let's say that in previous months, you've been making $1 million profit every year. That's the red part. And this month, you hired him. He's doing great. He, now you're making $2 million in profits every year. How do you say he's doing? Good. Good? Yeah. Everyone likes more profit, right? But the answer is maybe good. Probably good. Possibly good. You just don't know. It's one thing if you can get more money from your existing customers, if you can upsell them to higher plants, that's fantastic. If you can bring in customers that never would have found you otherwise, maybe you market to Europe or Africa or Asia, that's fantastic, that's found money. But what if you sell them to customers that would have bought anyway? They would have bought next month, but you gave them a 25% discount. What if you find all the customers that would have bought next year and gave them a 50% discount? Over the long term, over the short term, yes, you make more in profit. But over the long term, you'll be making less money with the same exact customer base. When you think about income and revenue and profit, you really have to focus not only on a snapshot, but you have to understand where that money is coming from and what the trade-offs were in order to achieve it. And I've never been able to find anyone that could actually answer this. I do have an answer, though. I saw a company offering training for $900, and the list price of an iPad Mini is $400. So that's total $1,300 if you want both. Or that same company will offer that very same training and that very same iPad for $1,600. People buy the $1,600 plan. It's not because they're bad at math. It's free. It's exactly right. When you're selling products, you have to remember there's three different people. The people spending the money, the people making the decision, and the people using your product. One of the biggest mistakes I see is people focus on the ones using their product, or to a lesser extent, focusing on the people spending the money. You always want to go to the decision maker. And this is an example of what's called a kickback. And what people have figured out is, yeah, i got to take training anyway. My boss is paying for it. It's not my money. Why not get a free iPad at me? Why not? The line item is just going to say, training. Sounds great. So to sum it all up, Pricing is more than just picking a number. Pricing is a strategic tool that you can use in order to achieve your goals if done properly. Or if you mess up a little bit, it can really hamper all of your endeavors. If you'd like to find me online or read my blog, you can go to taprun.com. You can email me, Adam at Taprun. And occasionally on Twitter, the Adam Judah. Doc, the Adam Judah. And uh, feel free to praise me on Twitter. <laughs> Does anyone have any questions? I answer all the questions. Yes. How important or do you see as important to have a plan when you're starting out as far as how you're going to approach pricing? Whether you're going to be giving freebies or whether you're going to be going to the end. Is there any simple rule of thumb that you do? Yeah, you're, you're, so the question is, how do you plan for your pricing when you're just starting out? And the answer is, it depends on a lot of things. One of the things that it depends on is it, is it a product? Is it something with recurring revenue? Or is it consulting services? If you're just doing consulting, you can mess up quite a bit and just raise your prices as need be, if needed. But if you're doing recurring revenue, it's really hard to go back to those existing customers and say, I need more money. You might have to grandfather them in. One of the most interesting things that I've seen is a company, and I keep getting their name wrong, I believe it's Pinboard, which had a scaling pricing model. First user spends, I don't know, a dollar. 
And as the network effects kick in, because it's a social bookmarking site, each additional person has to pay more. The next guy pays $2, the next three, four, and so on, and it scales. But the more flexibility you'll have will come from whether it's a one-off service to different customers. You really have to plan pretty smartly if it's a product.